I'm so excited to have Sean here. Most of you already know him, so I don't even need to introduce him, but I'll just hit some of the highlights of his incredible work. He, he's a director and principal consultant with Yes to ECE, formerly Teaching Excellence Center. He's an early, an early childhood training coaching and uh, consultancy. He's a nationally recognized professional development facilitator, and he brings 29 years of experience, expertise, and commitment to advancing the work of adults involved in the lives of young children. In addition to his work at Yes to ECE, Sean is a lead coach consultant for the state of Pennsylvania Office of Child Development and Early Learning, Infant and Toddler Coaching Program. <clears throat> he supports coaches throughout the state and as a program administrator with Yale University Center for Child Development and Social Policy. He trains and facilitates the use of child tool for early childhood mental health consultants across the country. Sean is contributing author of Trauma Responsive Family Engagement in Early Childhood Practices for Equity and Resilience that was released in fall of 2021, so just recently. Sean has taught preschool, college, provided early childhood mental health consultation, led a countywide early childhood program, um, provided training and technical assistance for state universal pre-K program. He's taught pre he's uh, also um, taught for here, taught here at first five for many, many years. And we appreciate him so much and so appreciate you, Sean. You, I'm I'm pleased to call you friend. So great, thank you so much for being here today. And thank you everyone for attending. I see some familiar faces there. So it's good to see you. Uh, take it away, Sean. Thank you, Beth. We so appreciate you, Beth, and you, Leah. They work so tirelessly in the background, not just with me, but with so many to offer you all these uh, no cost professional developments for people who are brand new and novice to the field and folk who've been doing the work of a number of years and folk who've been doing the work for decades, and it's difficult to, to meet the needs of uh, kind of like that tiered PD. And uh, they do work hard at offering a variety of, of things. So I'm so appreciative and grateful for Leah and for Beth. Um, and I'm grateful that you're all here. This is the third time is the charm is what I'm calling this. Um, the last two times I had like situations with the hospital and family where we had to cancel. So this is our third rescheduling of temperament in 2022. So I'm happy that you all were able to find some time in your morning in your day um, to come out and hear some things that may be familiar to some of you um, or some things that, that might be a little bit new around temperament. Um, Cause I see some very skilled folk um, on, on, on the call. Uh, I will say that you, you will have an opportunity for two breakout rooms. Uh, and for those who may be at work or in places where you need to keep your, your cameras and things off, in terms of issues of equity and virtual learning, I'm asking that when you go into those two breakout rooms, you're gonna do one in the beginning and then one towards the end. Um, I'm gonna ask that when you go into those breakout rooms, that that's when you cut your cameras on and make sure that the folk can hear you so that they're not forced to look at a black screen. And if you need to go back black when we come back to the larger group, that's fine. But I really want to um, encourage that because when we come back, we're gonna be hearing from uh, your groups and, 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 and some things that you all talked about. All right, so with that being said, I'll share my screen, Beth. So Beth, we don't, we don't get to deliver that, that news, right? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay. All right, so everyone should be able to see my screen now. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So temperament in 2022, temperament in 2022. So Beth basically told you who I am. For those who don't know me, I'm Sean Bryant. Um, and as she said, I'm the director of the Teaching Excellence Center. Um, it's, it's my consultancy where I offer um, consultancy, training, coaching, uh, across the state. And my second role is as program manager for the Child Skill Tool. It's an assessment where we train mental health consultants and coaches across the country on the tool designed to reduce and eliminate suspension and expulsion um, around how we create healthy climates in early learning settings. And that's through the Ziegler Center for Child Development and Social Policy at Yale, um, which is where I spend most of my time. And what you see on the screen is just a little bit about me and how I, what I deem important around how I enter this work and um, 
what guides me, really what guides me in, in 2022. I'm still practicing gratitude for those who have been wondering. I started at two months into the pandemic because I started to lose it. And I'm really, really happy that I grabbed a hold to gratitude as a strategy and a, a practice. So happy about that, very happy about that. In this virtual learning process, um, we're gonna raise awareness about temperament. You're gonna learn about temperament and you're gonna practice some skills in small groups. Um, and in those small groups, it will only be three of you. There will only be three people because adult learning theory tells us that when adults get together, if we're in groups of more than three, the fourth and the fifth and the sixth adult actually don't participate. So we use the science to guide um, what we do here. So I'm encouraging you all right away to grab a pen or paper, a marker, chalk, crayons, dry erase, whatever you need to take notes. Um, afterwards, Leah will be sending you all when it gets uploaded to YouTube, um, a copy of the slide deck and some nice handouts to go along with the slide deck. Um, so not to worry, not to worry. Um, you will have all of these things and it's being recorded. So we, it will be uploaded to um, First Five Alameda County's YouTube page for you all to review over and over and over. As always, I've jumped in and created the community agreements. Um, I actually used a picture from a former First Five training. Beth, you see yourself there at the bottom left? So we encourage everybody- oh my to God, there I am. What happened to me? To speak openly. Um, we want you to bring your experience and your wisdom forward. Um, and always think about the role and responsibility that you have in this work of servicing our youngest citizens and their, the adults who care and educate them. Um, you all know I'm practicing gratitude and I'm a, I'm a fan of it as a strategy. Um, and let's just be open to hearing some, some, some new things when we're in the breakout rooms. And the big takeaway, you all know I love um, Rick Hansen and Marin. Uh, he introduced me to this concept called JOT. And JOT means just one thing, not too much, but just one thing. That if you do nothing else, part of the agreement for this no cost PD is that you'll walk away with just one thing that you're gonna understand and do differently as a result of participating in this really short um, introduction to uh, temperament and, and, and what's new about temperament. And we definitely encourage you to use the chat box or even unmute if you can, um, because all voices are welcomed and encouraged here. And we, um, we want to hear you participating at, at, at that level. So let's jump right into our learning objectives. We're gonna define temperament. Um, and we're gonna talk about some differences between temperament. I'm gonna talk about personality just a little bit because some people say, oh, they're the same. Your temperament and your personality are the same. And you know what? Some of the research even, um, it's not contradicts, but they've come up with some different things depending on what researcher you talk to, um, if they're talking about temperament in young children, temperament in adolescents, or temperament in adults. Some of it actually reads differently and says the opposite of what the other research says. Um, and that always happens, that always happens. So we're gonna describe the you know, temperament types and temperament traits um, and, and, and talk about some limitations of the original research and really look at how we can support children um, in terms of our grounding and understanding of temperament in the short period. So we're gonna actually jump into our first breakout rooms. See, we're jumping right into it. You're gonna be in that breakout room for 15 minutes. You're gonna have opportunities to say, hello, this is who I am, and then get to discussing the comparison of two children. So I'm gonna share with you this um, brief kind of scenario. So, so listen, some of you may need to listen with your eyes closed. Some of you may need to look away, take your hands off the keyboards, but let's listen to this scenario in the comparison of two children. So we have two children, they're both the same age. One is easily upset. This same child enjoys quiet activities and enjoys being hugged and held or even cuddled by the supportive adults in their lives. Let's call this kid Jack. The other child who's the same age, is always a happy camper, very active, 
rarely gets upset, doesn't enjoy sitting still. Let's call this kid Jill. So they clearly have some temperament differences in how they approach the world, which is really the definition of temperament broadly. That shapes how Jack and Jill both experience events and challenges in their young worlds. The differences are evident, right, in their emotional responses, their self-regulation and their attention. One is active and rarely gets upset and doesn't enjoy sitting still. The other one is easily upset, enjoys being held and enjoys quiet activities. They seem polar opposites, but they may have some things in common. Everything that describes them in that, those brief descriptions impacts their sleeping and their eating habits. How quickly Jack and Jill respond and react, the intensity and how long it takes for them to recover or come back to calm, all is connected to their temperament. New situations, while one child is happy to interact and explore, you know, their new preschool environment or their new infantile environment or their new play group or school age program, another child clings to the adult's leg or hands and says, don't leave me, I don't want you to go, while one lets go and runs and wants to engage new children and adults. So in your, your small groups, you're gonna think of Jack and Jill and how they were just described. And you're gonna answer some questions. I'm gonna put these questions in the chat just so that folk can have them, Beth. So the first question that you're gonna talk about is, why do you think Jack and Jill are so different? And that second question you're gonna talk about is, what determines our temperament? So I don't want you to Google it. I don't want you to ask Siri or in the background say, hey, Alexa, we don't wanna do any of that. Based on your knowledge, your experience, you know, I have a lot of teenagers, Carol is laughing. And like, I have an iPhone and I wanna say, I've had this iPhone, this is probably my fourth iPhone. And it's literally just last year, I started saying, hey, Siri. My nephews happened to be, look, I just say, hey, Siri, and it beeped um, with me one day. And one of them just kept saying, hey, Siri, hey, Siri. And I was like, who, what is he talking about? So I got up, they were playing a video game and they were talking about football players. And he kept asking Siri the data on football players. So when I got up and went in the other room, I realized what he was doing. My brother was like, they're his sons. He was like, they do it all day long. They just ask Siri everything. So it was like this eye-opening experience for me. Like, wow, people are really asking Siri everything all day long, which was, I knew it existed, but it was new to inform me. So I want to encourage you not to lean into that because I know there are some people on the call who may enjoy Siri and Alexa. Um, and I want you to keep enjoying them, but I want you to use your knowledge, your experiences, you know, what you bring to this work of children and families in early childhood education. Um, the third question of impact is thinking of the adults in children's lives and the practices that those adults might have that affect the children's temperament, the practices. So that's the third question. The first question is, why are these children so different, Jack and Jill? What might determine our temperament? In the, I'm using the word adult in place of using parent, family, teacher, or caregiver. So when I say adult, I'm referring to all of those people and you know whichever audience appeals to you is the frame that you can use. But I'm using the general broad term of adult so that I'm, I'm attempting to be inclusive. Well, welcome back. It looks like folk are coming back. We had great conversation here in the main room, um, Leah, Beth, and I, um, and we had some listeners. So welcome back, welcome back. So in room three, we had Ron, Vicky, and Rizzolino. Ron, Vicky, and Rizzolino. So someone from room three want to share out some of the things you'd all discussed? That Looks was like fast 15 minutes, huh? <laughs> yes. It's never enough time. That's no better. If I gave you 25 minutes, you would come back and say, it's never enough time. And, and we are aware of that and I recognize that and, and realize it. Um, but uh, in, in this short piece, the whole piece is in, in this two hour PD, 
we're hoping to give us something to chew on. And then, like I said, when Leah sends the handouts, those are those other pieces where you'll be able to keep going back to um, looking at temperament and your understanding and some strategies around um, what, what, what you can do. So definitely. Ron, you are muted. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, everybody, you know, the, the other two can add in. That's um, everyone had good, good in, input. So in terms of, um, you know, why are Jack and Jill, you know, so different? Um, we talked about, um, um, you know, the way their, the parents' temperament in regards to parents' response or, or adults, including parents' temp responses to their child's behavior. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about temperament being um, something that's determined, you know, as, as young as at birth or, you know, maybe prior to birth, we'll find out today. Um, and um, in regards to adults' practices, um, you know, that has a lot to do with the, parent, the adults' uh, temperament themselves. And um, also we talked about how parents are role, how adults are role modeling behaviors for children. Um, so those are the things that adults can practice um, that determines a child's temperament. And um, I don't know, what you, anyone have one, anything else to add to those? That was fantastic, Ron. Yeah, we had a good conversation. I did the, have a question. The third question. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay, so I did have a question. I'm a social worker. Um, I deal with people who were raised in traumatic childhoods. Mm -hmm. um, so I was curious, how does that affect your temperament? Does that change who the child is? Well, Definitely, and it can change, we, 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 we change the brain also. Um, I'm going to meet some folk here while I speak, but you can unmute yourselves again. Uh, I'm getting some feedback. All right. So we thank you for the question, Monica. So there's some things that we actually know around um, temperament and personality. And a part of that are our, our, our genes, biology, and the environment all have, all have an effect on that. So we're going to get to that in, in, in the slide um, moving forward. But there's some newer research that we know about um, infants in particular, Monica, who uh, may be in, in, in foster care. So my baby brother, who's 25, um, my mother gave birth to three children, but you better not tell her she didn't have four um, because my baby brother, it's a serious situation with her. Uh, my aunt said something to her one time about that, that not being her son and they ended up not talking to each other for quite some time. Let me just say that. Um, but he came to us very, very, very young by accident. Um, and we, we know some things based on Dr. Bruce Perry's research around children who are in foster care. So there's something, and we're still figuring it out. So Dr. Perry and his team have been tracking children in the foster care system um, from infancy into adolescence. So they have like 16 year olds who are in their system hundreds of thousands of children. So this isn't like they track 14 children, hundreds of thousands of children. And what they found was two months after birth, this thing happens that those infants two months after birth that are in chaotic homes and those infants that are in non-chaotic homes. So what they found was the infant that was in a chaotic space two months after birth but they move quickly into foster care and then moved into a calm, supportive environment, those children would grow up and as teenagers, they started having some, 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 some issues and some concerns compared to the children who actually, their home life was calm two months after birth, but they were still removed from that home and placed potentially in a not so organized home, those children actually did some things differently. So here's what their research found when we talk about temperament and the environment and personality and brain development. That at infancy, because we're talking about the base of the brain, so if we kind of use Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain, what happened to those infants two months was the underdeveloped parts of the brain up here, the developed parts of the brain. So I'm in a chaotic home at two months. So this part of my brain is taking in all of that information but it's actually sending signals to the underdeveloped part. So when I grow up at 14, guess what starts to emerge? 
all the disorganization that's just been lying there. So we fundamentally have some evidence um, for hundreds of thousands of children, Monica, that um, that does happen. Now, in the direct correlation to temperament, um, we know that the environment has a direct effect on it. Um, even though our temperament, we're going to get to this. I'm jumping ahead, Monica, but it it stays the same. Like I was telling my group, I am by nature a shy human being. Most people don't believe it. Cynthia's looking at me like, no, he's not. People who know me, I am actually quite shy. Roz, like I'm calling BS. I am shy. My family knows it. People who really, really know me know it because I'm slow to warm when I go into new spaces. I'm that person that will go into the conference and I'll sit in the back at the table by myself. I literally have to talk to myself and do self-talk to say, show when you walk in, make sure you smile and walk to the front table where there's an empty seat. If I don't do that, I plop in the back by myself. It, and, it's, and people think, oh, he's standoffish or he's, he's over there frowning. It's actually my internal shy nature that never goes away, that influence. What I've developed as an adult is some strategies to combat that shyness that bothered both of my parents. I had hot, my parents were highly social, highly, highly social my whole life. Everybody knew my mother and father. They liked them. So they had this little boy that wanted to hold their leg and not say hi to people. So they were both like, what is wrong? Like, what is wrong? Not understanding that it was my temperament that was fundamentally different than theirs. Luckily, they didn't hold it against me and they still loved me and nurtured me. But that's that piece that stays the same, but can look different. And we're gonna talk about that um, as we move forward. So thank you for the curious question, Monica. I appreciate it. I, I, I just wanted to add um, that I'm a social worker at Alameda County in adoption. And, um, and also I've been an adoption home study worker for several years. Anyway, I, a large majority of our kids were prenatally exposed some to multiple substances. Mm -hmm. And then that and multiple placement um, changes, you see a huge impact. Of course, I, I can't like say direct, this direct causation, but um, you know, that the, the prenatal drug exposure causes, a, and then also prenatal, the mother's prenatal situation, domestic violence, et cetera. Um, you know, we see, you know, inference from day one of, a lot of difficulty with um, self-regulation and self-soothing and then that goes on, you know, and then it's really important to match them with caregivers who are able to cope rather than, I mean, help them rather than just react, be reactive to that. That is so true, Mary. That is so true. And I think one of the big pieces around, not just children who are placed in care, but children who are at home with their biological parents and families um, children who live down in the valley and up in the hill, children who live in the city and the rural area, children who live in between, that fundamentally this notion of self-regulation, this big what I like to call $20 word that we put on children and inadvertently adult on them, that the expectation is so far beyond them. Because what we oftentimes miss, I think in this country, is that no child, no child shows up and self-regulates on their own what they need is co-regulation through adult. That we've really got to understand that this notion of self-regulation is a social phenomena that all children should be afforded with a calm, connected adult. And it's through self-regulation that as an adolescence, I would gain self-control, which is an individual thing. And we, we mix them up. We want children to show up. Like our state standards in California talk about children doing all these things in preschool that are really them having all these few huge capacities. I know some gamefully employed adults who make six figures who have really bad self-regulation um, because this is ongoing thing that if it's not supported, we never really gain it because it has to be promoted. So this notion of particularly children in foster care and matching them with the right care, it's important, but they're teachers, people in their communities, the during after school programs, the coach, we all have to understand this that, oh, Sean is nine, he's four, he's three, he's 13, he's 15. He's not doing this to bother me. He needs me to connect with him in this calm way where we connect and then we co-regulate. And I model that repeatedly so that he can then what? Gain the control that we say 
lot of those children don't have. And then we go back to the beginning and say, what was the drug exposure? He was in four placements before he was seven. All of those things are a part of it. But what we find that's always missing, Mary, and this is really severe toxic stress. Toxic stress exists because we know fundamentally you can put 100 children in a room who've all experienced toxic stress and they'll all give you a different story. The one thing that shows up in every child's story is the absence of one positive adult. So if we see that as the absence of the positive adult and we go back to the beginning, oh, nobody's co-regulating with this kid to help them gain that, that has an impact when we think of environment on our temperament. And I'm gonna say this piece and then we're gonna move forward, Mary, because we could do this the whole time, Mary. I'm loving this. The other piece is the work. And Leah was bringing this up. She shared some awesome stories around being a parent of two young children and how their, their temperaments are different in her oldest child whose temperament is really different than hers, Leah has done the work of acknowledging we have different temperaments and that what bothers Leah, her daughter doesn't really experience it because Leah is bringing herself back to, oh, here's her strength, here's her capacity. How do I show up different? So we actually call this getting in sync. This is really important when we think of temperament and temperament types. And then the child that may have a high activity temperament and a parent that may have a slow or sensitivity threshold that's different than their child or their children that they're teaching, it's our role and responsibility to understand that we're only in sync with children 20 to 30% of the time. So when Leah talks about that, she's saying, I'm not in sync with my oldest kid right now because she's only gonna be in sync with her 20 to 30% of the time. Guess what most of us drop the ball? The work of parenting, the work of being an adult, the work of being an engaged, productive teacher, social worker, regardless of our role, is the work of getting back in sync. So the work is always getting back in sync. Most of us say, this kid's just not listening, and we wipe our hands and do nothing to get back in sync. And oftentimes, you know what's lying underneath that? Temperament differences. That if we're not aware that, oh, this kid has a different temperament than me, and their temperament bothers me, and I don't understand it. I can't do anything to fix it, all right? So we're gonna talk some more about that. These are some great questions, great questions. So we're gonna quickly go through this piece. We're gonna quickly just go through the temperament traits. Um, so the first trait we look at is activity level. This generally you know, looks at the level of motor activity when we are awake or asleep. You have, um, I know when my, my nephews and my god kids were little and then, you know, everybody wanted to get in the bed and I would be like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to go sleep on the sofa because they're kicking me in their sleep. I'm like, how did you just kick me that hard and you're dead asleep? Motor activity, activity level, because um, it involves our large and our small muscle movement. So things like running, jumping, rolling over, holding a crayon, picking up the toys, all of those things are the activity level. So when I think of this, I think of, um, my goddaughter who's in the, uh, the second grade, she came out with a very high activity level. We're gonna talk about twins, Usha. We're gonna talk about twins in, in, in just a moment. Um, all of this is about understanding the trait and then we're gonna talk about the types and some more current pieces of the research. Another one is what some folk just abbreviate as regularity. I like to call it biological regularity because this refers to the predictability of our functions like eating, sleeping. Some of you ever, and particularly with older people or with younger children, some of you may say, my mother or my auntie, she eats dinner every day at 5.15, like clockwork. That's her biological regularity. And when it doesn't happen, her mood may shift. Some people know, oh, you know what? I'm going to visit my brother. I'm spending four days there. I need to get in the bathroom and do this at this time because if I try to go into the bathroom at the same time I do when I wake up at my house, I'm gonna to have to wait an hour and a half. That's because we're really up against someone's regularity showing up in their lives in this way that, that we see around their functioning, all right? It's temperament. The next one is adaptability. Here we're looking at how a child and adult adjust to changes and transitions. Changes and transitions. So my godson, who was 10, um, when he was in Head Start, I actually happened to be the coach at his school one time. And um, 
at first I was like, I'm not going to tell him that I'm his godfather. And uh, his parents brought him to school one day. And of course, they they said, that's my son's goddaddy. Because he didn't tell him because he was quiet. And I was like, I'm just going to see what happens. Um, and they had no idea because, you know, how we are in this country, because he happens to be Asian, they just assumed he would be anything but like my godchild. But he's slow to task. He needs us to talk about the transition before it happens. He needs you to tell him, you know what? When we finish breakfast, we're going to go um, sit on the bench and we're going to put our shoes on and then we're going to put our jacket on and then we're going to get in the car. He needed, he needed that repeated, repeated multiple times. And when it didn't happen, he would be that kid that kind of stood there. And his parents kept thinking, we need to get him assessed. We need to get him assessed. I picked up on it quickly. I was like, he's just slow to task. He needs to hear it two or three times. Sometimes he needs the picture. Sometimes he needs us to hold his hand. And the more that they did that, they started saying, we see some fundamental differences in how he's responding, um, particularly when his younger sister um, came. The next one is what we call approach or withdrawal. This really describes how easily we, oh, did I just do this? Which thing did I do? This one looks at how we adjust to new places, new people, new things. It could be food, it could be a new school, um, it could be um, a new house, it could be me meeting some of my parents' friends, some of my siblings' friends. How do I approach this? Am I uh, running in and saying hi to everyone? Or am I standing behind and just watching and not saying anything because the situation is unfamiliar? I see the questions. I'm going to get to them. I want to get through the traits first. Um, the next one is sensitivity threshold. Sensitivity threshold. Oftentimes, this is written as just sensitivity. You might see it with the word threshold removed. Um, but this, I like the word sensitivity because if we think around about how this describes um, our how physical stimuli, there's things like light, sound, and textures and I may have a high threshold for it. I may have a low threshold for it. I know that I'm one of those people, if I'm really tired, I can fall asleep with all the lights on. My brother, if the light, the TV, the light from the hallway, the light from the street light is on, it's gonna wake him up and he's, he needs it completely black. He's, his sleep is gonna be disrupted. So you can imagine when we had to share the same room um, and as the oldest, I got my way he was really troubled because I used to bully him. I'm, I'm admitting it, um, but we have a loving relationship today. I no longer bully him because he's bigger than me, um, but it's because we love each other. But our, our, our sensitivity to the light was really different when we slept. Um, and that's just two kids in the same household, same parents, but fundamentally our response, our internal response to that is different. And you can imagine children who can't articulate or don't really know what's going on, but they're bothered by it. So what happens is their whole body responds and we see it as a problem behavior because they can't say, I hear the noise from the people next door in their house. Whoever's in this room, in, like in some places where houses are connected, those things could be bothering children and they can't articulate them. So that they may scream and yell as a response because they, they feel like they have no power, no control. How we respond into that innate sensitivity is important. All right, I'm gonna speed up some more here, Beth. Mm -hmm. So this other one is like the intensity of our emotional response. This looks at our energy levels, right? And our emotional response to both, po to both positive and negative responses. So before this, I was on the, uh, a training. It was the fourth component with a group of people in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, they were getting trained on that Yale child scale tool. And you know, like many early childhood programs, they were like, we're unique we're different, um, we're better. So they were having a hard time integrating everything that they were hearing. Um, and they had these emotional responses to everything as a group. Now for two of them, I could clearly see it was their temperaments. I think the other folk were just following them, but my temperament, which was the important piece, right? My emotional response was none. They were giving me negativity and I gave them back what I hear you in validation. I'm in control of that aspect of my temperament. Some of us lose it easily 
Some of us lose it easy. I often say this to Beth. Had they met me when I was 25 or 27, they would have gotten a different response. But at 50, I'm totally in control of this in a way that I wasn't then. Um, that's that thing that says, I oftentimes still have a high emotional response to things, but because I have a lot of tools in my toolbox, the world doesn't see it. It's still inside of me. And those are those pieces that we can offer as strategies to these children who are in care, to young children in our preschool programs, to children in our elementary programs, that to validate their emotional response, the level of intensity, nothing's wrong with it, but here's their appropriate response. And we can teach those to children, and that's part of the work. Figuring out what works for them, their household, their school, their community, because one thing that may work in one household may not work in the other household. Um, so we have to figure that out and become detectives um, with children, because that's the strategy, figuring out what's the appropriate emotional response. The example I like to use sometimes is I had this little girl, this little boy named Wyatt, and Wyatt was actually told by his grandfather that it was okay to cuss when things were upset. So he would curse a lot. Um, that was his emotional response to things he didn't like. And he would say, well, you know, my, my grandpa told me it was okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, okay, the grandfather told him. So instead of us saying, don't curse Wyatt, we had to say, you know what? It's okay that you're upset. But at school, when we're upset, here's some things that we actually do. Without, without ever saying your grandfather shouldn't have told you that your grandfather's wrong. And when you know what we never said? Why it don't curse? Because that would have prevented him from integrating anything we were saying. We compartmentalized his emotional response to strong things that happened to him and said, at school, here are some ways we can handle it. Those are the strategies that we have to offer up to children. The next temperament trait is distractibility. Distractibility. This really looks at our level of concentration or focus, our lack of concentration or lack of focus. And then we have mood, 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 often referred to um, in, in, in a lot of the literature, particularly in early childhood, as just mood, not quality of mood. Um, but this really looks at our tendency to react to the world in mainly a positive or negative way. And we usually situate ourselves in one or the other as our general mood. And then that final temperament trait looks at persistence, persistence, which really is like the length of time that we can continue an activity, here's the big one, in the face of challenges or obstacles. The length of time that we can continue an activity in the face of challenges. And this is different for each and every child and each and every adult. So before we get to temperament measures, which I'm probably going to go through fast because I'm paying attention to the time, I'm going to look at some of these questions in the chat box. Ooh, I see paragraphs here, Beth. So Nina says, if I understand it means temperament is really who you are um, and Jack and Jill are different because of who they are. Does this mean that the response of the adult affects the child's response? It definitely can. Not just their response, but the message they begin to tell themselves, which we talk about temperament being an a lifelong influence, the messages that they can begin to tell themselves. So you're definitely there. Usha says, what about twins coming from the same environment? So there's a difference between um, fraternal twins and identical twins. Um, so we know, I'm, you hear, I'm jumping ahead because I don't want to forget the question, I'm old Usha. So we know that what we find is identical twins because of their genes. Remember they came from the same egg, which is why they look so much alike compared to fraternal twins where there are two separate eggs. Um, we found in the research that identical twins function more alike, whereas for fraternal twins, um, their temperaments were more different compared to identical twins. So we do know that from the research literature. Uh, Monica says, I have a client whose mom was borderline. The mother wouldn't self-regulate and model that happens all the time, definitely, definitely. So, you know, it, it sounds like a, a lot has to happen there. Um, this notion of couldn't self-regulate, you know, it makes me think of Monica, we're, we're wanting the mother or the parent or the adult or the older sibling, the adolescent who's raising the younger children because they're 19 and legally able to keep them, but still learning about life themselves to possibly do something that has never been modeled and demonstrated for them. 
So that's a big thing. You want me to self-regulate, but imagine if it's never really been a part of my skill set. We've got to slow down and stop and take some steps back to talk about one strategy at a time. Meaning when your child does this, what could you do? You know, when your child, if this happens to you and your child, when you're waiting for the BART, what could you do? When you your child to drive it in the car and this happens, what would you do? And I want to wait for them to position those scenarios for me to then offer a listening ear around what they would like to do and what they're doing. Because we know that when we give people the answers, they tend to do like this. They say, oh yes, that's a great idea. <laughs> Lions cracking up laughing because it's happened to you. We know this from like years of research, um, particularly Richard Boyatis' research where they're looking at the brains of when people are getting advice, the task positive network is activated. So I say, yeah, I'm gonna do that, Christine, but I'm really doing this. And then Christine says, he said seven times he was gonna do it and he hasn't done it. It's because it came from Christine. So what's getting integrated is she's telling me what I'm doing is bad and wrong. So I can't, I'm closed down to 30%. But if Christine says, so Sean, talk to me about when that happens. And this isn't about being a therapist. This is just about holding this therapeutic space that I can what validate someone's lived experience in the way that leads them forward. And it goes back to their temperament. The more I understand their temperament, I understand what, how to respond. One example I often use is, with adults, when I supervise the site in San Francisco, I'm thinking of Jen, Yvette, and Lauren. They all worked in the same infant room, but they were all fundamentally different. If I needed to speak with Lauren, because she's a Leo like me, she was straight no chaser. Lauren lived up the street in the upper height. The school was down the street in the lower height. She was late for work every day, 905, 907, 911. She's supposed to be in her classroom at nine o'clock. So every day at nine o'clock, you know what would happen? The teachers would say, can you come in here? We're out of ratio. So the next day I said, you know what? I'm just gonna wait for Lauren when she gets to work. She was taking her coat off, making her coffee. I said, good morning, Lauren. I said, Lauren, look at the time. I'll never forget it. I said, it's 9.08, you're late. I said, when you get to the corner and I can't talk, this is our temperament. I can't do this with every staff. I said, when you get to the corner, do you see a bus going down the street? She said, yeah. I said, that's the one you're supposed to be on. That was the only conversation we ever had. Guess what happened? Lauren was never late again. Had I said that to Yvette, it would have been a situation. Had I said that like that to Jen, it would have been a situation. When I talked to Yvette, I would say, when you take your break, take it and let them know you're gonna take 10 to 15 minutes more and I'm gonna send Lupe in the room. I said, let's go for a walk. So I would literally make her walk with me to the park, to the Bose Park. Cause I knew when we were walking, she was probably going to raise her voice and she was going to curse. And I didn't want to say, lower your voice. Don't be who you are. I understood that that was something she was working through. And when I met with Jen, I had to do it differently. And it wasn't there, oh, I'm just meeting these individual needs. I understood their temperaments and who they were and that they needed me to pivot and shift at their supervisor to not say everybody fits into this box, but for me to say, this is how we fit into the box. And I'm going to do something differently based on Yvette's mood, based on Jen's attention span, and based on Lauren's emotional response, which is always low. That's the thing that children and adults we work with need us to understand about the, the temperaments. So Carol says, the study says, babies born during COVID-19 pandemic have lower IQs and cognitive development due to the stress for pregnancy. Okay, that's, yeah. So you know what, Carol? Yes, and we found that there's some other studies that looked at, because here's what I here's, here's what I really know, because we do it all the time at Yale. You can find what you look for based on your research questions. So I say that to say, Carol, that is, that's something for us to understand around this kind of lower, IQ if we're looking for the IQs, but we actually find when we were talking about learning loss that young children during the pandemic, and this is research from 2020 and 2021, they've looked at constrained and unconstrained learning. Constrained learning are things that children get when they go to Head Start preschool or in their K through 12. The teacher has some discrete skills they need to teach. Unconstrained learning is I'm home with my abuelita, 
and we're on the sofa and we're just looking at a book and I'm talking about the pictures. Both are learning opportunities, but one is constrained and one is unconstrained. And they found that children were gaining skills in the unconstrained environments of home, but the research wasn't looking for it. So we all of it's happening. And in the midst of us being in a global pandemic that we kind of still seem to not know what to do, children are getting some things. And I think it's a dangerous message and I'm gonna move on because um, I feel like I'm getting on the soapbox, Beth. Um, I think it's a dangerous message when we say children have learning loss when they're home with their parents and families. Because the message to the families is really, you don't know what the hell you're doing. I think that's a dangerous clarion call that we inadvertently send and not real, particularly those who aren't parents or aren't parents of young children. The message is, you don't know what you're doing. Your children are safer with us at the school. And I say safe for who? Because the research says, if you look like me, school is one of the worst places for you. So that's a whole nother thing to, for us to unpack and not just have a conversation about, but to have some policy about. So Carol, yes, and there's other research that looked at things that children were gaining um, in the pandemic. I read two opposing, this is the same thing about temperament, research reports. One said, children aren't getting the social emotional needs met because they can't see their teacher's faces. When I say it was three days later, another research report said, children are gaining skills because they're honing in on the teacher's eyes. And they're get, I'm like, they just said the opposite. <laughs> They literally just said the opposite. One said the mask was a problem and children weren't gaining skills. The other one said these toddlers and preschoolers actually focused in on what was happening here when this was closed and they could still see, sense that the teacher was smiling underneath the mask. So remember I say in research, we find what we look for. So the real question is how do we ask better questions? So it's the, this is the equity part of research that when researchers can ask better questions, they're gonna get different answers and different responses. That's, that's really what's happening there. So Mary's the last one. Mary says, we see placements fall apart due to children's emotional behavioral issues. That's right. And the, ooh, it just moved. And then the same child flourishes with the new caregiver, not necessarily a good, bad situation, but a poor match, goodness of fit. We're gonna get there. Um, we're gonna get there. All right. So Beth, I'm gonna stop paying attention to the questions, but if one pops up and you think I need to answer it, Beth, then that definitely, that definitely slow me down. Cause- um, Okay, we'll do. Great questions we'll do. coming up and we can just- Yeah, I think the other parts of this, these pandemic questions, and I think there's a lot more that we have yet to know about some of this. And that includes things like uh, environment and care. And anyway, so um, I'll watch the chat. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. So this notion of measures of temperament. So we, we, we measure temperament in different ways or we study temperament in different ways um, through questionnaires, behavioral observations and uh, psychophysiological measures also. So we, we ask our questions as adults and clinicians and parents and teachers and caregivers about behavior. We observe the behavior or then we use the, the measure. So some researchers use these questionnaires um, parents or teachers answer them um, about the child's behavior across different situations and ages. And I'm going to give you one website where they have a parent one and the, um, a teacher one for uh, measuring temperament. Um, and then some others. The one that most folks are familiar with in early childhood is the one at Georgetown, um, where you used to be able to download it. And now they have it um, all electronic. And those are two widely used ones. Um, one widely used adult or parent report measure is the infant behavior questionnaire revised. Um, here parents rate how their infant shows different behaviors such as vocalizations and even fears, right? Um, they answer questions. We all know the questions. How often during the last week did the baby, you know, become startled um, to a loud noise or all of a sudden? And those types of questions help them to, to kind of gauge where that child's temperament situates. So I'm, I'm gonna move past this one quickly. So then we classify temperament in three ways, easy, difficult, and slow to warm. But this has changed over decades of research. So we all are familiar with well, some of us may be, some of us may not be. Pediatricians, Alexander Thomas and Stella Chess, they were pioneers in the field. And it began in the 1950s, remember that, right? Where they interviewed parents about their child's behavior. We've heard, I've heard about this through my whole career. 
Um, and then they scored those child's behaviors as low, medium, and high in those nine categories um, that I just went over. Those behaviors have been grouped together to form three temperament types, the easy, the difficult, or the slow, the warm, as indicated on the screen. But there were limitations to Drs. Uh, Thomas and Chess's research. And we're gonna talk about those limitations um, in just a moment. So let's unpack this a little bit more. So when we classify temperament, this easy or flexible child, what we find is only 40% of most children are grouped in this uh, classification for temperament. And we know that these children typically, um, they have an ease to what their biological rhythms, they have an ease to their adaptability, their approachability, and they're generally in what positive moods, um, but they have a little mild to what we sometimes call medium intensity. You know, the, these, these are the adults you work with that you think everybody just loves Beth. Everybody just, and it's probably because Becca's temperament is easy and flexible. You, you all know those people at work and in your life where you say, everybody loves this person. Look at their temperament. It's not always what we know, but it's our temperament. You might also want to ask my mom. <laughs> that's right. That's right. She has a whole different understanding of Beth, right? That's true. That's true. So we know that these children are easy for adults. They typically are easy to toilet train. They learn to sleep through the night. They have regular feeding and napping routines. Um, they take easily to new people um, in, a, in, a, in a healthy way. They adapt to changes quickly, and they're oftentimes cheerful, um, and they express distress or frustration mildly. These are the children, when I was a consultant, the teachers would always say, oh, we just love Eric, and they would all smile. What they were really saying was, Eric has a really easy, flexible temperament, and with these 24 kids, working with Eric makes it a lot easier. Um, we actually found in the research that children with easy temperaments may show up with very deep feelings, we may only see what Eric shed one tear down his cheek. So we have to pay attention to also what the easy and flexible children around those deeper components that becomes easy to miss. Because you know what we often do? We don't ask Eric how he feels because we always see Eric as easy and flexible. So there's still some things we need to do to support Eric um, in the context of conditions of being positive, productive adults in his life. Someone asked a question about kind of what we were talking about, but can a presenting temperament, what people see from the outside, differ from internal temperament? And I think you addressed that a little bit earlier, Sean, by, you know, the override that we learn as adults because society needs us to be, or a job needs us to be a certain way. It's tiring, but people can do it. Right. And, and then how our parents model for us. So I love this picture. So this, this notion of the difficult or feisty child. We found that 10, it amounted to around 10% of children fell into this classification. And this happened to me. Um, I've, I've flown lately a few times and the woman was on the plane and you can see she was struggling and the baby was crying. I just happened to be, we were actually on two flights. We flew from one flight to Dallas and then from Dallas, I was going to Salt Lake City, Utah to do a two day training. And you could see on the second leg, I was literally across the aisle from her and you know, she was trying to breastfeed and the baby wasn't taking, um, and it wasn't a small infant, a, a larger child, but you could see the frustration on her face. And I kept thinking, Sean, say something, Sean, say something. Because my assumption was the baby's not latching on because they can, can sense your frustration. And I kind of just leaned over and smiled. You know, I pulled my mask down because I, you know, they make you keep your mask on. So I was like, let me drink something. Then that gives me the reason to what, pull the mask off. And I kind of drank it and smiled. And I just said, it's okay. I just literally said it to her. I said, it's okay. We all know it's a baby. Guess what happened? Her whole affect began to change. When I say five minutes later, the baby was no longer crying. So these difficult to feisty children, there's still strategies that we can use. They're actually more in tune to us most of the time. And that attunement that they're seeking when they're feeling like their the adult is in a tune, it can escalate them. So feisty children, um, they're clearly the opposite of Eric, the easy, flexible child, right? These children are oftentimes, what, hard to get to sleep at night. They're really picky about what they want to eat, feeding. 
their schedules may want to change from day to day. Um, they're oftentimes sometimes difficult to toilet train, particularly we know that male children typically toilet, walk and talk six to nine months behind female born children. Um, and that male children who are parented and has a mother um, with depression or undiagnosed depression has a direct effect on her male child differently than it does on her female child. And it further slows down the developmental timeline. Um, so we need to know this. Um, you may have a child who shows up in your care, in your school, your program, um, who experienced those things, and we've never known those. So when the social worker shares some things about the history, those are important things because it tells me I need to show up differently for this child to um, meet that need, that individual need. These children oftentimes express what their frustration, what's unpleasant um, in their disagreeable mood. I'm thinking of my middle guy child. If she's upset, we all know. In contrast to what the easy child, this child is intense. They oftentimes have a noisy reaction to everything around them. The best way to do it is so we simply have to wait it out most times, unless we can prevent it. If you can get there in the beginning, so caregivers who don't understand this feisty, difficult temperament type, um, we sometimes end up seeing what? Children who get older and the adult has a resentment towards the child because they were so difficult to manage. And when those ruptures happen, what ends up happening, we talked about this in my breakout group, those children usually hold on to that throughout their lives because of how they were scolded, how they feel like they were never um, able to please the parent and we're gonna talk about goodness of fit in just a moment. So this third type, this third type is slow to warm or fearful children. And there's only 15% of the children who are um, like me, shy. You know, in this group of children, they often have discomfort with new ways and they adapt slowly. That's me. I need to think about how is this gonna work? Can I really integrate this? I gotta ask myself a thousand questions. Um, but unlike the feisty child, these children's negative moods are oftentimes expressed slowly. And these children may or may not have a regular sleep feeding or bowel eliminations. Really a fundamental difference between the slow, the warm, fearful child and the feisty child. These children are oftentimes on the periphery or at the edge of the group. They may cling quietly to their adult, their parent, the teacher, when they go into the new store, at the birthday party, or as they enter, the new program for the first time. And when these children are pressured or rushed to join, guess what happens? That shyness doesn't go away, it becomes worse, it becomes worse. But if you give us shy children enough time to become accustomed to new, situa new situations, circumstances, people and places, we often can thrive with gradual support from the adults. So let's look at some limitations, some temperament limitations because we said there were limitations to uh, Thomas's and Chester's research. And we just covered it. So some of the limitations are here on the screen. Those easy to flexible children, 40% of us. Those difficult or feisty children, 10% of us. Those slow to warm or fearful, fearful children, 15% of us. So if anyone's doing the math, that's what? That's only 65% of children. So where are the rest of the children? Did they fall into you know, a hole? Nope those 35% are still out there because only 65% of children fit into one of these temperament types. Here's some things that current research that's still rooted in Thomas and Chester's work, but now some new ideas about classifying temperament um, emerged around um, that 65% and that 35%. Because part of that 35%, what we know is that children who fall into that 35%, two things happen. They don't fit neatly into those categories. So some of those children at 35%, they actually make up dual categories. So they have components of those three, which is why they don't fit neatly, they don't fit neatly into one, all right? And then they're always outliers where there are children who say, nope, I'm not any of these three. And that's what comprises that 35%. And part of the original research, um, which is why I did it this way, kind of like, here's just one box. Think of it as a box. Here's this other box, and here's this other box. Those are the classifications. 
but we talked about the new research. So Mary Rothbart and her colleagues, um, they actually uncovered a new temperament model over the last 30 years of their research. So unlike doctors Thomas and Chess, they didn't label children as certain types. Instead, what Dr. Barbart and her colleagues propose is, is we should think of what temperament on a continuum. So you see that pink continuum and you see the blue, easy as light, difficult gets a little bit bluer and then slow to warm gets a little bit darker, which means you know, if I had the capability and I had a pendulum that I could move back and forth, what their research over the last 30 years says is, compared to Sean saying, oh, I'm a slow to warm shy child, Dr. Robert's research says, actually, Sean, you're gonna move across this continuum, the lifetime influence. So therefore, when I'm saying, oh, I'm a shy child, I was shyer as a child, as an adult. So I was over here in the slow to warm as a child, but now as an adult, it's a lot easier for me across that continuum, which is why we lay it out this way instead of boxing it together. So that's one of the ways um, around how uh, Dr. Barbara and her colleagues have kind of brought this notion of temperament to um, a more recent continuum and understanding that we're not grouping children into these kind of rigid categories, but this continuum gives children and adults the opportunity to vacillate across that continuum um, in terms of this lifelong influence that temperament has on us. So this goes back to a question earlier around um, when someone asked about the, 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 the identical twins. So what determines our temperament? The first thing is like this notion that children are born with certain temperamental dispositions right? In that our temperament guides how we approach the world and it affects how what adults respond to them and some children, their peers. We should just say people there. But what determines our unique temperament? We start with biology. So studies show that identical twins, like I said earlier, temperament traits are more similar than fraternal twins. About 50% of the differences in temperament come from our genetics, our genes. So what we know is that genetics have a stronger influence on some temperamental traits. For instance, a child is more likely to inherit a disposition for negativity compared to positive emotions. I'll say that again. A child is more likely to inherit a disposition for negative compared to positive emotions. Sciences and researchers have found a link between specific genes and individual differences in serotonin. Serotonin is a naturally um, occurring hormone in our brain um, that reduces anxiety, um, and depression, and, and, and fear. Um, and it, it's really like that. So if we think of cortisol being the stress hormone, then we think of serotonin and dopamine um, being those, those hormones that make us approachable, but they're the same ones that are responsible for addiction. So people who can't put down their cell phones, people who can't, can't stop smoking, people who can't stop drinking, people who can't stop shopping, people who can't stop gambling, all of those addictions, we're getting um, that drip. And then if we move to like the thinking part of our brain where we get an oxytocin drip, which is based in relationship and trust, which is why when you see your best friend or your cousin that you've loved all their lives, as soon as you think about them, your body starts to smile. That's our body's biological response in our brain around those chemicals. But let's get back to this biology. We know that low levels, low levels, so we talked about the serotonin can reduce anxiety and depression, right? At higher levels, but low levels can lead to what? Negative emotions, negative emotions. This explains how what our genes influence our temperament, that our genes can influence our temperament. So these genetic factors that the research looks at they basically help to determine temperament, but they're just part of the picture. They're just part of the picture. And I think this is what someone who posed the question was getting at earlier. The other part of the picture is that environmental factors and experiences, because the experiences dictate how our genes are expressed in the environment. 
They play a big role in shaping our temperament, a big role in shaping our temperament. So everything that comprises the environments that children what navigate space in on a day-to-day -day basis, where they live, where they go to school, where they play, where they eat, where they shop, all of those environments that have what adults and other humans and other experiences in them play a part in shaping um, our temperaments. So if we look at the social and cultural communities um, that determine this notion of what we keep calling temperament, this really guides how we approach the world. I'll say it again, it guides how we approach the world. So some of you may be saying, well, someone asked a question earlier, I think about gender. So why do they exist? Why do they exist? Well, it's due to biology. Researchers found that during the first years, boys tend to be more active than girls. But some other research found that boys are more active than female-born children. Let me change my language. Male-born children are more active than female-born children. See, this is the result of living in the Bay Area. Um, you, you want to have language justice. Um, but we actually, actually know that a huge part of that is how we socialize children based on gender also. But it, it has an effect. It has an effect on the developing child. So we know that females born children tend to be more fearful than boys. But is it how they're socialized? Or does it have a lot to do with biology? So we do know, we do know that Male-born children, opposed to female-born children, that male-born children, when those gonads descend and say this fetus is going to become male, male-born children's brains are washed in something called androgen. And fundamentally, what we know is that male-born children show up in the world more emotionally sensitive than female-born children. And for those of you who may be married to males, this is the answer to why your husband is a big baby. I just gave you the answer. At birth, his brain was in utero, his brain is washed in androgen, um, huge. What we know is, um, so they did a, the still-faced experiment with a bunch of children. And this is really the research from the, the documentary in the book, Raising Cain. Much like the still-faced experiment that they did where they put the mothers and had them look away. Um, they did this experiment with male children and female children. And what they found when they looked at gender was that when the mothers looked away, the female born children would try to have a bid for the mother's attention. And then she would say, okay, you're ignoring me. All the male children on the other hand, when the bids were not acknowledged, they all fell apart. And what they fund fundamentally believe is that androgen plays a huge part in that and how our temperaments show up and are expressed um, based on environment and experiences playing a role in that. So our temperament, often can change to fit with other people's expectations and values. It can. So what parents are telling children, so imagine having the child who is slow to warm and they hear their whole life. Speak, say hello, go to the front, don't be shy, don't be scared. So they're hearing who they are is not enough mm -hmm. their whole lives. So they might attempt to meet what the expectations and values of those adults in their lives. Or the parent, what discourages being shy based on my image of their gender or how I want them to be like my temperament, like my temperament. You know, Sean, there's uh, someone asked a question about temperament changing over time and you've been talking about this, but um, it, it seems to me that there is this internal temperament as you've been saying that we have but that we learn to override it some um, as we grow older and have to interact in the world. Just do, what do you think about that? Oh, well, not when it, here's, here's what I read that. Here's what I read. Okay. Um, so this notion of, and here's where the research actually doesn't always read the same, depends on whose research you're looking at. Yeah, it's true. So in terms of our temperament staying the same throughout our life course, it's always there we gain skills and capacities and it shows, yes. up different, it shows up differently. So I like to say our temperament pretty much stays the same throughout our life course. Our mm -hmm. personality 
can change based on our age, gaining more skills and more capacities. So that personality around who we are and how that's expressed can definitely pivot the temperament. Remember, Dr. Barbara, Mary Breckbar and her um, colleagues said that it's a continuum. So we're moving across that continuum. And as we move across that temperament continuum, what actually happens is my personality changes, but I'm still on that same continuum. It's just what expressed differently on one end, it may be easy, but in the beginning, it could have been what I could have been slow and took me longer. But on the other end, now I've gained some capacities and some skills. So it's easier for me because I'm aware of my temperament, but my Got personality it. is really the one that stays the same. Great. Yeah, Sometimes you. you'll read about the two of them. And there are some researchers where you can tell they haven't done a deep dive because they talk about them um, interchangeably like they're the same and they're not. I've read some, some articles where they're actually talking about temperament and personality and people will start discussing them as if they're actually the same. And um, one is an outbirth of the other. Like I just said, the, this notion yes. of um, our personality is the broader piece of how we show up in the world. But underneath there, this, this notion of how we're born and show up in the world is, is our temperament. It is our temperament. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the time, Beth. Um, so we're already an hour and a half in. So we were, yeah. do a, we were gonna do another breakout room and then come back and talk about goodness of fit, the brain um, tailoring to the child's temperament. You know what, we might be able to do it. We might be able to do it. Um, okay, because I, I really wanted them to go back into the breakout rooms again. And now that we've talked about temperament some more and we have some more knowledge for it, to go back to those scenarios around Jack and Jill, one being easily upset, um, enjoying quiet activities, enjoying being held and cuddled. Um, and the other one, you know, Jill, she's always the happy camper, active. She rarely gets upset and doesn't like to sit still. In those two curious questions, why are these children so different? What determined their temperaments? And how can the adults in their lives, their parents, teachers, and caregivers demonstrate practices that affect their temperaments? in positive, productive ways. Sure, Nora. Nora says, let's shorten them. That way we can get through it. So Nora's helping me to think. We can definitely shorten it. So Nora, you know, some of the other people wanted longer. So Nora says she wants to get through it. So we're going to shorten the breakout room so that we can cover the rest of it. So thanks, Nora, for that. So for those who want to be in the breakout room for 25 minutes, don't get mad at Sean. The other people spoke up. All right, welcome back everyone, welcome back. So we talked about Jack and Jill again, now that we have some other information about um, temperament in the continuum and the new research. So I'm just gonna pick. So we had Wendy, Rayanne and Ejiv, E-J-D-V. I'm not sure if that's the actual word or just letters. So some of them on room four, would you like to go? In room five, we had MC and Namaya. Would someone in room five like to go? Share. In room six, we had Celia, Shaying, and Ruby. Might be time to call on people. I don't know. Yeah, I think I'm trying to do that, Beth. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see here. I'm just going to. Let's look at a name. Sounds on. like you have a lot of folks with the temperament of slow to warm up in the room, Sean. <laughs> right. Oh, oh that oh, is man. so awesome. Bra unmuted from himself, so that means he's going to share out. Thank Oops. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh what I get. That's what I get. We want to hear from you, Ra. Um, hey, Sean, I have a question. Yes. I was wondering when you were showing that arrow, that pink arrow that's to the left and to the right about mm -hmm. the percentages, I was a little bit kind of confused about um, the other 35%, what happens to them? Is it that they could have um, all of the temperaments? Because I thought temperament was something that we were born with, even though our disposition and environment kind of affects it. Mm -hmm. Does it mean they, we could have all three? 
of the ten I, parents or one child or one you're person? An, you're answering your question a little bit. Um, it's yes and. So Leah, Leah was in my group, and she just tried. Her she said my daughter doesn't fit one of these categories, but she actually fits two of them. So the thirty five percent, she said, her daughter has two of those broad categories that we see up up there. And many folk may comprise some of those, and then some children don't fall in, into either of those categories because they're always outliers. You know, that, that's, that, was, that was part of the original piece that only had 65% of the children. Um, now the pink arrow says that we none of us fit neatly into a box. So the new research says we all vacillate across that continuum. So that's why it's a continuum because we're moving. We can get to the slow to warm where the blue's a little darker, and we get back to easy where the blue's a little lighter that we, we all have that capacity opposed to us originally seeing it as this fixed piece that you're in this box, that that continuum says, you know, we can all move children and adults across that temperament continuum. So over time, over years, as we grow up, we, our temperaments could change. Your temperament not necessarily changes, how it expressed is changed. That's why uh -huh. it's, so you, I'm still on the continuum. So let's say um, for let's 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 pick a let's pick a trait. So let's say for adaptability as, as a trait, right? So I'm one that easily adapts to changes. So okay. if, we look at, if we look at the continuum, we can say when Sean was four, he would adapt to changes, but it took him a little time. He was slower to oh. adapt to changes. Um, now he integrates changes really easily into his life. Oh, okay. So the expression of it. Still adaptable, but how it happens, because I'm moving across that continuum. Or here's a big one. So mm -hmm. let's say Sean is adaptable. Adaptation at work, really easy. Adaptation at home in my personal life, really difficult. Mm. My house, don't move my chair. I got a cousin that likes to show up and move stuff around. She doesn't see the best of me. I've had to put her out twice. Do not come here rearranging my furniture. This, this, this chair's in the wrong spot. It's in the perfect spot for my house where I pay the mortgage. You, want, you will not make a good husband for me, Sean. I love to move things around. I need, I need warning. You got to let me know. I'm thinking about changing the furniture tomorrow. Okay, we, we, we can do that. I, I have some warning. But this notion of adaptability at work, I anticipate early and often as an adult that I need to be adapting to constant changes. Some good, some oh, not okay. good. But at okay. home, those changes don't need to happen at that rate. So how my adaptability is expressed shows up differently in both, oh, okay. of, those, um, in both of those spaces. Thank you for the question. Thank, thank you. So thank you for putting that in the chat. They said, in our group, we discussed some strategies to use providing positive emotional support, spending time, involving parents and taking development through screening tests, all of those pieces. So when we do that, I would say, then go deeper. When you say spending time, say, you know what? I'm gonna spend more time with my children at the end of the day. Or you know what? We're gonna wake up earlier. I'm gonna spend time with them and sit at the table when we eat. Get specific about those goals um, around how we're gonna build those things. Um, this is These are great. And I would say, tease them all out. When we say providing positive emotional support, what do you mean? My kid has a fit when we're in the car and I need to put them in a car seat. So I'm going to be intentional about here's what I'm going to start saying as I'm putting on my coat before we even get in the car. So drill down deep because that's how we integrate it into ourselves and it becomes habits that we use because we find them successful. So thank you for all of that um, in, in that group. I appreciate those. Um, all fantastic. All fantastic. So I'm just to speed up a little bit just because I want to be mindful of everybody's time. So this notion of um, goodness of fit, I'm jumping across slides. So we know that children's life experiences, right? We all have lived experiences and they have a powerful impact on our temperament and our developmental outcomes. The adult practices in particular, parents, teachers, caregivers, affect a child's temperament and their development. Children can't choose or we can't choose their temperament but we can change how we respond to it. And Leah, I think, speaks eloquently about this. 
So a child's parent, teacher, caregiver, or environment provides a good fit or a poor fit for their development or their temperament. There's a goodness of fit when expectations are compatible with the child's temperament, meaning the adults are adapting and pivoting their behavior and the environment to meet the needs of that child. So let me give you one example. I'm thinking of Max. Max was shy and anxious when I taught him my Montessori preschool in Berkeley, especially in new situations um, when he first showed up in the classroom. But Max had um, three parents. He had two moms and a dad who were all sensitive to his temperament. They provided a stable routine, okay? And it, they promoted a sense of order and security, which helped him. This allowed plenty of time for what? Max to take in those new experiences. So Max continued to be what? Quiet and reserved. And he may continue to be quiet and reserved as he grows up. But because of what the good fit between Max and his parents and caregivers, we know that Max is likely to become a well-adjusted adult. So let's think about this for a moment, right? What would it be like if Max's environment was a poor fit for his, um, his temperament of being shy and anxious? Without that stable routine and bringing in unpredictability, that could easily overwhelm Max and heighten his anxiety. What if Max's three parents pushed him into new experiences instead of letting him take it slow? How might Max respond? We know that without that sensitive caregiving, Max may develop co trouble coping with daily challenges. This could lead to what? Low self-esteem, loneliness, and greater anxiety. This is why this goodness of fit is key. And this goodness of fit fits like a hand in a glove when we think about getting in sync with children and we're only in sync 20 to 30% of the time, and the rest of the work, Max's parents did the work of getting in sync with Max, um, even though his temperament showed up differently than theirs did. So we know it's easier to create a good fit for a child with an easy temperament. It requires a lot more pivoting, shifting. I hate to use the word work. And Leah talked about this both times eloquently to create the good fit for a child's development, different rather, temperament behavior. So her older child has a different temperament behavior than her younger child. But the pivoting and shifting and work that she does creates the good fit. And she will say, it's a lot of damn work. Um, but the worth it is on the other end of who her child is becoming as a human being. So essentially, she's being a sensitive parent and adult and creating sensitive environments for her child or both of her children. Because we know that adults, we can encourage adaptive behaviors by introducing appropriate demands on children, regardless of their temperament. This is that aspect of goodness of fit. This is that aspect of goodness of fit. The interplay between the temperament and the environment is gonna what? Shape the courses of a child's development. So temperament becomes more stable at around age three. And there's a bunch of things that happen. Typically at around age three, you know, toddlers, we know their receptive language, what they hear and understand, far exceeds their expressive language by 12 to 24 months. Then it's typically at around age three that the expressive language, what I tell the world, catches up, which is why temperament becomes more stable, which is why our memories go from, um, the amygdala, which is our fear center to our hippocampus at age three, which is why most of us cannot remember being nine months old, being one and being two. Now there's always somebody who says, I remember being a one year old, go ahead with your bad self. They're telling you a lie, they can't. We just got some brand new research that I literally read on Monday where this one research project, we're looking at two and a half year olds. So they found that two and a half year olds in their, in their memories around what they were able to remember over a period of time, but they're not adults yet. So that's, that's still in development. Let's see what they remember when they're 35, um, around them being two and a half during the global pandemic. So if we know that a child's temperament becomes more stable at around age three, um, it's at this point around how a child responds to what different situations that become predictable and not predictable. This is partly due to the changes in the brain that occur at this time. So we always talk about self-regulation. So one of the temperamental categories 
Um, and if we have more time, so Dr. Brockwright and her people, there's really so much more to her research that I just didn't have time to put in here. This would have literally been a four or five session if we really looked at the parts of self-regulation that her research pulled out, but it's one of the temperament categories. So self-regulation skills are linked to the prefrontal cortex and the interior um, cingulate cortex, which we see here. I like to just call them the thinking parts of the brain. And this is where logic and thinking exists. It's the green part of the brain or the gold part of the brain. It's the decision-making part of the brain. It's the slowest part to mature. Um, and it's the last part to mature. But remember, Dr. Perry's research says things that happen early in life, they percolated up and they lay dormant until that part of the brain began to develop, which is why seeing what happens to children, development, and it's tied to temperament is important, very, very important. Um, I feel like I'm moving so fast. This always happens to us, Beth. So temperament and typical development. So we have to be careful to distinguish because this oftentimes happens. Typical development responses from a temperamental trait. Here's what I mean. So the example I like to use is, our one-year-old clings to his mother anytime they enter a new place. The one-year-old might show, you know, an appropriate response to strangers. It's totally appropriate. But another one-year-old might have a shy temperament and a lower tolerance for the newness and the novelty of those new people, those new places, and those new things. One is temperament, and one is typical development. These two children need different types of support. It is important for parents to tailor, and teachers, and caregivers, and grandparents, and tias, and I believe this, the demands on children's unique temperaments. So I gave some examples earlier around how I tailored the demands to Yvette, Jen, and um, Lauren, because their temperaments still get expressed as adults. So, but for children, this will help understanding the temperament and the typical development parts of how they show up. Because sometimes they get murky to people and we kind of make them collapse on top of each other. Um, but we've got to be able to tease them apart because when we tease them apart, we're going to meet the unique needs of a child's temperament and to help them develop into a well-adjusted adult, um, no matter what their temperament is, it's possible. Sean, I just want to say we can go over a little if we need to. People that need to leave can always listen to the recording, but I think it's really good that we get this information out to people. So if you have to leave, um, you can watch the rest of the, the what you missed will be on our on our uh, YouTube site. We'll send you the link, um, but I think it'd be good to get this information. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. I always forget about that. Topic. So caught up in the next slide. So developmental outcomes. So we know that our temperaments actually serve as a building block for our later personality. And I talked about that earlier. That's an outbirth of that. So what we see on the screen here is you may have a four-year-old that says, you know, I'm shy. How that child thinks of themselves. So when we think of development, that child is in the social situation in that preschool. How are they going to make sense of their experiences? Because we want that experience to, for them to say, I'm accepted opposed to I'm not accepted here. So as personality, as a broader feature of temperament, not just temperament, this includes how we get children to think about themselves and how they make sense of their experiences about themselves, their peers, and definitely the adults in their lives. So here, what we're really talking about is temperament can influence how well I am in my Head Start preschool program or my kindergarten or first grade, the actions I take to exert energy to do well or not do well, and my emotional well-being. I'm not responsible for all of that myself. The adults understanding my temperament, the environment, and how temperament is expressed are responsible for setting up those positive, productive environments. At the core, we find temperament. So if we think about how our temperaments influence different areas of what our lives, that means we're thinking about children's activity levels and how they relate to later social behavior. Remember when we said, I said earlier, think about that person you work with and you think, everybody just loves Beth. Everybody loves Beth. 
we're going back to that temperament that was, you know, developed and expressed as a child that was either encouraged the way Leah supports and encourages her child's unique temperament or squashed down with the message is how you are is not okay. So an example that we can offer up is we know that active preschoolers tend to be what? More social and energetic. And active preschoolers who are social and energetic tend to be what? Social and energetic when they grow up. At the same time, what we know about development says there could be a risk of them engaging in what? Impulsive and aggressive behavior. So if we go to the other end of that continuum because we love to do that in the United States. Less active preschoolers tend to be shy and inhibited. They sometimes become more self-conscious compared to their active what? Peers. So a child's ability, and you all know this, I'm reminding you, to regular emotions can change how temperament influences development based on their temperament trait and where they are on the continuum where they are on that continuum, really important. So there are many, as I move to the next one, interventions. So one of the ones that I like is called Insights Intervention. We're gonna put the website here now. They actually have a free, um, parents and teachers can do a free uh, temperament trait um, piece, just like, you know, you can go to zero to three has a great temperament video and all of these are gonna be on the handouts that Leah send you all for the resources. But I just wanna spotlight this one um, because it really looks at how uh, adults and clinicians can use this goodness of fit model to design interventions at both home and school. Because the goal of all of this is what? To create greater supportive environments that build on each child's unique strengths. So what you see on the screen now in some of their categories where they call high maintenance, industrious, shy and cautious, and social and eager to try. Um, this prevention, because it is an intervention and prevention program um, that looks at child, the children's temperament. So the adults are um, trained in the, the intervention. It's a 10 week program that children, their parents and their teachers involve themselves in um, around recognizing a child's unique temperament. Um, after they identify their child's or the children in my classroom's strengths and the areas of concern regarding temperament, they learn about, here we go, this big R word, the relationship between the child's temperament and their behavior and the adults in their lives. So this, this intervention really shows that the process that the adults engaged themselves in changed their attitudes towards the children. It also increased their motivation. Here's the big one. This is why I have this on the screen. It increased their motivation to help their child or the children in their classroom. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So the other part of the program um, really, so here are some of the, the puppet characters because they use puppets in this program. And uh, the puppets represent different temperament types. They practice using social strategies that use that lead to positive outcomes. So we have Hillary the hard worker, Coretta the cautious, Gregory the grumpy, and Freddie the friendly. I'm not pushing anything, but this just gives you context on for teachers and parents that said temperament is important. You know, we hear it as this concept, but what does it look like in practice? So here they use this intervention where the rubber meets the road to tease it out in this way that was helpful to teachers, parents and um, children. So we're almost there. So temperament as a, as a unique piece. So we know that each of us has a unique temperament, right? It influences our relationships. It has a piece in how we, what we achieve at school and at home, and definitely an impact on our physical and mental health. All children are born with a temperamental disposition, but remember that temperamental continuum says, we can change, we can build more capacities. We don't choose our temperaments and our parents don't create the temperaments. Rather our biology and the experiences interact that determine our temperament. They determine our temperament. So one of the things that um, some of you may have heard about is this notion of the orchid child. 
Some temperaments can be more challenging than others, even though I shudder at using that word challenging, but that's the word many adults use. So children with, you know, those challenging temperaments are the ones that kind of frustrate adults um, are oftentimes described as orchid flowers. So we know that in unfavorable conditions, orchids wilt and wither. But at the same time, with suitable loving care, orchids can bloom in a way where they're unique and magnificent, unique and magnificent, but they have to be what cared for. So the same way the children that we're talking about, the children that we care for, our youngest citizens, we can support them. The adults in their lives can adapt our behaviors in our environments, the environments where we bring, where we teach, where we educate, where we care, where we love um, our children, we can adapt those environments to fit their temperaments. So earlier, Beth had said when we first started, we were having a conversation, and she said, wouldn't it be great if parents were able to find preschools that fit their child's temperament? So a child that has an active temperament, you know, would not end up in a preschool um, that's in a government building or in a high rise, where there's very little space for their bodies to move, but they would have access to this preschool that meets what their child's temperament. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? So how do we help the adults and children's lives understand that the whole physical space can what support or work against a child's temperament in terms of this concept called goodness of fit? And this is why creating a goodness of fit is important. If we're sensitive as parents and families, teachers and caregivers, children learn that they can respond in new ways that actually supports their unique regulation. So this unique temperament in these orchid children are just as important as the other children who show up with different capacities and different capabilities. So we're almost there, Beth. So I just want to offer as a strategy so that we don't get stuck with the labeling, because that's not the intent behind temperament. The intent is just what Leah talked about, learning about herself and her daughter through the temperament lens and, lens and doing something about it. So I like to say we label jars, not children. So that means one of the things that I want anyone to do is to leave here saying, Sean's just like his adaptability level, and that that, that becomes the language of how we identify children. This is not about that. This is about us gaining some core resourcing to do some things different. So we label jars, not children. You know, it wouldn't be a training without me unless I talked about the brain um, and its needs. So I'm just gonna quickly go through the language of the different components of the brain. You all know I like red, yellow, and green because it resembles our stoplights here. Um, so the language of our brainstem for children and their temperaments is sensation. So the communication we need to give children who are at that bottom of the brain, that brainstem, is sensations. That's movement. Those are things like rubbing their hands together, blowing the air, blowing bubbles, teaching them, you know, we, we teach our children these things where we teach them, they hold a fake cup and we teach them to blow. They have to blow the hot cocoa. So this notion of if we want to calm that part of the brain to meet a child's temperament, then the strategy is always we appeal to sensation at the base of the brain. The middle part of our brain, which is the limbic system, the language of the limbic system is feelings. So those children who are slow to warm and shy, they need to hear, around, hear language in, around the feelings attached to, I know it's scary, we're going to a new school or we're about to get on this bus for the first time. It's gonna be a long ride. There are gonna be lots of people on here. It's gonna be exciting. And we're going to get nervous. I'm a little nervous now just thinking about it. How do you feel? That's that appealing part that appeals to all temperament types. And then children who are in that executive state, the language of the cortex is words. That's that thinking and logic. I need to slow down to hear what this child is thinking. They need to slow down and hear what the adult is thinking. So regardless of temperament, we need to appeal to children at all levels of the brain, because each level of the brain is seeking a specific kind of communication. And these are the languages of these parts of the brain. And this is one training in and of itself. Um, I, arrived, I think left already, but I did a whole session for the, the parents and staff on the language of the different parts of the brain. And we only use this one slide. 
it was all movement. Um, but these are strategies that we can offer ourselves and young children. So in closing, two more slides, Beth. Remember, families are at home working, not working from home in a global pandemic. And I'm just reminded of Lillian Katz. Um, she's in her 90s now, but years ago, it was over like 25 years ago, she said there were seven distinctions between being a parent and a teacher that are beneficial to children. And that we've got to understand that when Leah's home with her children, that's different than when she's at work being a mother. When she's home being a mother, we can't expect her to show up and do it the same way. Um, and that the more we expect that, we're doing hurtful things to children and families that definitely have an effect on what, how the adults in their lives respond to their temperaments. So with that being said, thank you all for your time and attention. We went over 11 minutes, so I appreciate everyone that had the capacity to stay. Like I said, um, First Five offers trainings to everyone. So we're always mindful that there are those of you who showed up today who, um, this was your first experience with temperament. And there were those of you who showed up who um, have years of experience as trainers and researchers and program people. So we're always looking at across a continuum for everyone to leave with um, something that they can chew on. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Sean, really appreciate it. Thank you everyone for showing up, for joining us today. We really appreciate you so much. Please do complete your evaluation. Let us know what you thought. Um, let us know what other kinds of trainings you're interested in so we can be sure to provide you with some uh, training opportunities that work for you. And again, the three month uh, evaluation will come in three months. So I'm gonna go ahead and thank Sean again. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Sean Leah. And I will have a, have a little conversation post-training to make sure we get all the resources out to you and ask that you that have participated, thank you all for waving. <laughs> it's going to get emailed. Thank Usha, you, Beth and Sean. Leah's thank going to you. email the evaluation sheet. So Usha is going to come in and email. And I hope to see some of you at the, um, the All About Our Bodies. It's going to be really good. So yeah. hopefully some of you will be there in two weeks. It's going to be exciting. Yeah, it's going to be great. So thank you all for coming. And um, go ahead and click that little leave button in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, I can also give you a little help if you need that. Um, so Sean and I can do a debrief. Thank you.